before we take a photograph there are two things that happen that we do without realizing first of all think of yourself as an explorer we go out we're looking for the perfect photograph we're trying to find them in the environment around us when we find that perfect photograph when it has been revealed to us then our second ability kicks in and that's our composition we suddenly become composers we think about how we want to arrange the elements of the photograph what we want the viewer to focus on and specifically what it is that we capture and composition is the key to good photography of course everybody has their own opinion about what is a good photograph but i'll help you in this lesson to get you on your way to better to our lesson so composition lesson number three i want to make sure you get it perfect every single time and composition unlike our technical ability is something that will only come with practice now um, it is subjective that's the one thing i'll say at the very start of this lesson what we consider to be good and what we consider to be a bad photograph is somewhat a matter of opinion that said, if you're going to argue that a particular photograph that you think is good, that someone else thinks is bad, you really need to have the, the knowledge and the know-how to back up your argument. So we'll have a look at how you can improve your photographs uh, by following a couple of guidelines. And of course, like anything, once you know the rules, you can go and you can break them and you can make your photographs be more unique. So a um, first of all, we're going to kick things off about you know, what is good and what is bad when it comes to composition. A couple of terms to get familiar with as per usual. Composition itself, the words, uh, point of view, uh, POV, rule of thirds, uh, balance, cropping, aspect ratio and focusing modes. These are all things that we're going to be speaking about throughout the lesson. And when we kick things off with composition, starting, we talk about, first of all, good composition. What is a well-composed photograph? With our photographs, we're composing all of the elements. We're arranging everything within the photograph, um, you know, instantaneously, really, without even realizing it in some cases, to create a photograph that looks good to us. So good composition, the main subject is clearly communicated to the viewer. Focus, exposure, and composition guidelines are all correct. Now, I, I say that in inverted commas because, again, it's subjective. Um, but there is still some rules that we have to follow. The viewer's attention is held. You know, the viewer engages with the photograph. They don't just look at it, don't know what they're looking at, and move on. The use of color, motion, and depth of field all contribute. These are all compositional elements, things we'll have a look at throughout the rest of this course. It's free of distractions to the foreground or background. Your viewer's eye is being taken off the subject because of some kind of distraction happening in the foreground or the background. And basically, the photograph feels and looks well balanced and it's satisfying to look at. It's aesthetically pleasing and we come away from it saying, thinking, well, that's a good photograph. And here is an example of that. So here we've got a, a nice photograph here of a jetty and we have uh, a nice sunset. Our horizon is perfectly straight, it's positioned correctly as well, it's not too high, it's not too low, it's not in the middle either, and which can be a little bit jarring sometimes. So we've got a nice balance there, we've got roughly uh, one third of the sky still in here and two thirds of the rest of the photograph is made up of the sea and of the jetty here. It's well exposed, there's full of detail and colour. We can see all of the texture of the water. There's nothing that's too dark or too bright, obviously apart from the sun itself, which would be impossible to capture um, in this type of exposure. Uh, use of shape and lines lead the viewer's eyes. So we've got this triangular shape here that's bringing us through the photograph with this kind of line as well, just leading us into the shot. And we've got this horizon then, which also caps it off very, very nicely as well. So there's a nice use of shapes here in the photograph too. And it's in focus and the subject is very clear. We, we understand what we're looking at here, where we're being led through the photograph, um, you know, down this jetty, through the use of leading lines um, and to enjoy the sunset in the distance. Now, let's have a look at what we would consider bad practices uh, when it comes to bad photographs. First of all, the subject is out of focus. It's an unclear subject. The viewer is not sure what they're looking at. 
the viewer attention then wanders because they're not sure what they're looking at there's full of distractions in the photograph so there's there's things in the shot that are taken away from our primary subject it may be poorly cropped so you might have decided to crop into the photograph but you've 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 made a good photograph bad by poor, poorly cropping into the shot and there's little or no balance things just don't feel right things feel irregular and it's just uninteresting to look at it's just not a visually interesting subject so here is an example of that so this is a photograph here where first of all straight away we can kind of see that it's out of focus but we can see the top of the head is incorrectly cropped you know the eye line is too high up here in this instance it's too close to the top so it's not been uh, correctly cropped at all there's no sense of room or space it's very tight it's very claustrophobic there is a technique where we can fill the frame with our subject but this is a little bit different um you know it's it's unbalanced there's no sense of room or space as i mentioned it's quite claustrophobic looking photograph details are lost in the overexposure here we're losing details um, in the highlights there and it's out of focus so these are just some elements here that show that this is a poor photograph so the first thing that i recommend when you're out there photographing is to explore your subject the key to good composition is to take time with your subject whether you're photographing a person or whether you're photographing objects etc you want to take time to explore your subject you're not going to get that photograph in one unless you're very very lucky use your environment think about what's in the foreground and background but only use them to create a sense of space a sense of place don't use them as distractions in your photographs you still want your main subject to be clear and apparent if you're photographing people uh, it, or if you're photographing food think about using props as well to improve your composition to help give a balance to the photograph or even just introduce a little bit of color as well have some kind of plan some kind of idea of what it is that you want to capture in my experience you should always have a plan but things never go according to plan but you've always got that kind of backup there if needs be especially when it comes to photographing professional events but do have some idea of what in your mind's eye of what you want to capture that said best photographs are usually spontaneous the best photographs usually just happen and it gets to a stage as you improve with your photography you'll be able to anticipate and almost predict when something is going to happen to get the shot communicate communicate with your um with your subject and communicate with your viewer remember ultimately um whatever it is that you're trying to photograph that you're trying to capture it's going to be viewed by someone else so think about that communication exactly what it is that you're trying to communicate in your photograph be patient take your time you know it's 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 not going to happen straight away you need to spend time and be patient patience is one of the most important skills that a photographer needs to develop and you will learn how to anticipate you'll learn how to anticipate when something good is going to happen something interesting is going to happen particularly important when it comes to things like wildlife and um street photography you need to have an awareness of what's going on and be ready to react to it and just to give you some examples of that so here's uh, some famous examples so this one from Mayoshi uh, Sugita I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly uh, from Bowie from 1977 for the hero session of course um, ended up being on the album cover so as you can see here you know this is roll of medium format film 12 exposures here um, and we can see very very clearly the shot that he marked off um, as being one of the better ones and you can also see some of the other two here as well but this was the keeper but you can see the process here you can see how he's kind of moving um, you know through these different motions until that moment of magic happened okay so that's one example here we've got another very famous example from Dorothea Lang the migrant mother series the middle image here being one of the most iconic images of the 20th century but you can see the other photographs here as well while still interesting they don't have that extra quality that the middle image holds that that middle image that has almost kind of a religious kind of quality to it um you know compared to the other photographs but the other photographs really kind of showing the desolation and the struggle as well so just two examples there just to show you that you're not going to get it in one you need to spend time and explore your subject now you've already heard me mention a couple of times all about 
balance. What do I mean about balance? So balance refers to the compositional weight of objects in a photograph. That means that some objects have a lot of compositional weight meaning that our eyes are drawn to them and they need to be balanced out then with another compositional weight. Viewers eyes will tend to wander if a photograph is unbalanced. You know this is when we may not even notice something happening in the photograph because we're distracted by something else in the photo and again balance will come with practice but think of each element each compositional element each thing that you decide to put into your photograph as being part of a scale we want to try and keep that scale level so let's make this visual so you understand exactly what i mean so here we have a photograph take your time with this have a look at it and think about where your eyes are going in this shot okay so where did it go so if i'm looking at this photograph i'm i'm tending to start at the rocks down at the bottom I work my way, way over onto the left hand side but then i'm brought back over to the right by the lighthouse in the distance so i take in the entire photograph let's say we remove one of the compositional elements to this shot and we take away the lighthouse and the island okay so we're going to remove the lighthouse and the island and suddenly the photograph becomes quite different so now think about where we are looking in the shot and certainly my eye is being drawn over to the rocks on the left hand side that is because they're dark they're much darker than everything else in the photograph they just seem a little bit out of place now because we have lost the balance of the photograph so it just looks unbalanced it doesn't look correct to our eyes if i bring back our lighthouse so it pops back into the image and we can see that we have that balance in the shot so it's actually usually easier to identify an unbalanced photograph than it is a balanced photograph so if you're looking at a shot and you feel there's something not right about it it may be that there is a lack of balance to it so it's something else to be aware of now moving on to our focusing modes then so i get asked about focusing modes very very frequently and on our smartphones we have three different primary focusing modes first one is afs our, which is our main focus mode or one that we typically use by default af means autofocus s means single so afs means autofocus single shot now what this means is that when we take a photograph we focus the image or the camera will focus itself we take our photograph and the next time we take a photograph the camera will focus again it doesn't keep the focus from the last image so every subsequent photograph that we take the camera will have to focus each time that's what it means by afs now of course we can still choose where we want to focus using afs we simply touch on the subject like in this image here in the giraffe we just simply press onto the giraffe's face and the camera will take its focus from there if we were to take another photograph we would need to do the same thing again our the camera will choose the focus for us so that's afs our standard focusing mode now for fast moving subjects like children we have an option called afc this means autofocus continuous and this means that the camera is constantly focusing it's always focusing we don't have much control over this ourselves because the camera is doing all that the work in regards to focusing and it essentially tracks moving subjects so like in this image you see all these little focus points come up because it's tracking a moving subject it's a very complex focusing system great for fast moving subjects so like children running but anything like sports photography if you're trying to capture a moving car anything like that um, you want to use your afc your auto focus continuing mode finally then we have our manual focusing mode so sometimes the autofocus just will fail us altogether it just can't get the focus right usually in lower light situations this is an issue so if we're trying to do a portrait at night the camera may really struggle to focus this is when we can rely on manual focus this is basically we just simply choose to focus ourselves by pointing by touching the screen where we want the focus to come from now the camera will not do any autofocus at all so just remember that the next photograph that you take the manual focus will be set from the previous image that you took 
So the camera is not going to do anything with in regards to the focus. So you will have to keep refocusing the image manually if you're sticking to using manual focus mode. Now, of course, there's many more focusing modes available than this, which we will look at in due time. But these are the three primary ones that you should be using and are available on the majority of phones. Now, answer me this, a very simple yes or no question. Have you ever seen this photograph before? Okay, so if you're watching this on a laptop or a desktop, don't worry. <laughs> your, your computer hasn't just cut out um, and just revealed the background. So chances are you have seen this photograph before. Very simple, yes. Photograph, this is Bliss, and it's perhaps the most viewed photograph taken in the world, taken in 1996 by Charles O'Rear, who was a National Geographic uh, photographer along the Northern Californian Highway. A lot of people at the time, and still nowadays, think the image was photoshopped or um, was simply not real because there's an unreal kind of quality to it, but it really is all just about the quality of the light in the photograph. Many people have gone back to this spot and photographed it again and have gone nowhere near the quality of the shot that Charles O'Rear did uh, back in 1996. Now, it's considered the most viewed photograph um, of all time because of course it was available on uh, Windows and so many people had Windows uh, PCs, but of course that may change and most likely will change over the next few years, especially in um, if you think about all about Instagram um, and the amount of people that are posting up on that. There you go, a little bit of trivia for you. Now, so moving into our second topic, we're gonna have a look at guidelines and tips that you can use uh, to start improving your composition straight away. So keeping in mind the tips that we had in the first part of this lesson, these are guidelines that will help you, uh, that you can draw upon to make sure that you get a good composition nearly every single time. So some of these you may have heard of before, some of these might be brand new to you. The rule of thirds, symmetry, leading lines, the golden ratio and point of view. Now, of course, there's way more than this, but these are the main ones we'll focus on in this lesson. And as we continue on with our landscape and our portrait photography lesson in particular, we'll explore many more compositional guidelines. But let's start off with the most popular one, which is the rule of thirds. This one is so popular that it's pretty much built into every single camera and phone that you will purchase nowadays. So let's have a look at this photograph here. So we can feel that there's a good sense of balance here in this photograph, first of all. We've got a nice kind of tonality going on through the photograph here too. But the idea with the rule of thirds is that we have this imaginary grid that's made up of two horizontal lines and two vertical lines equally spaced. So if we overlay that on this photograph, we can see that we have these two horizontal lines going right across the just the top of the mountains there and very very close to uh, the walkway here as well then the vertical lines we have our um we've got the kind of lamp post there and then we also have the pier at the end and the people sitting there as well now the idea with the rule of thirds is that you want to use it as a guide that your compositional elements will fall somewhere within or close to these points so the points where the horizontal and the vertical meet, you want your, your um, interesting parts of your photograph to fall somewhere near them and it will help to give a natural sense of balance to the photograph. Let's look at some examples of this. Now here we've got a portrait taken in landscape format. We can also see here, there's not much going on here over on the left hand side of the photograph, but that's absolutely fine. There is still a sense that this photograph is properly composed. And if I bring over my overlay here again, we can see that this gentleman has been positioned to the right part of the photograph where he is basically falling on that right vertical line. That space that we have over on the left hand side, that's known as negative space. And even though it's called negative space, it's actually something beneficial to your photographs. It gives a sense of room and it gives a sense of space. And something like this is a great technique for photographing portraits in landscape format. Let's look at it in portrait format so it's not just limited to photographing in landscape format. If we photograph in portrait format, 
that is with our phones vertical we can still see that we have our rule of thirds applied and again in this photograph we've placed the seal's head at one of the points where the vertical and the horizontal meet and it gives a logical sense of placement again Everything else in this photograph here, you know, all of the water around here, it doesn't feel like it's taken away from the photograph. Again, a lot of negative space, but there's a logical sense of placement here because we've used the rule of thirds uh, to correctly balance this photograph. If we were to change it and have the seal's head in the center of the frame, it wouldn't really give us the same effect at all. And again, portraits in portrait format can be done using the rule of thirds as well. This is a really good example where we have that horizontal, sorry, that vertical line over here on the right. It's, it's perfectly falling on where the light is falling off. So this is a really good example of how light is used as a compositional technique to create um, this really powerful, uh, quite stunning photograph. So... Um, and again, perfectly aligned using the rule of thirds. So it's a guideline. It's a really good fallback for you if you're struggling to get a couple of shots. Uh, I will always take at least one photograph using the rule of thirds, just so I know that I have one that is usable. So it's a really good one to use. And it's great that you probably have seen on your phones already. It can be switched on, it can be switched off. Have a look at the display settings in your phones um, if you're unable to find it. But I recommend having it switched on, at least um, if you're brand new to photography. Now, so moving away from our rule of thirds, we also have symmetry. And symmetry is a lot of fun. It's a great compositional technique um, to play around with and to explore. And the idea with symmetry is that we, well, we want to find something that's symmetrical. And when we speak about symmetrical, um, we can think about it from top to bottom and from left to right. So this is a really good example of both of them, the, the Eiffel Tower. So we can see we've got a kind of a symmetry going from top to bottom because we have the reflection of the tower in the pool here. But we also have a symmetry going from left to right because um, we have that kind of those lines leading us into the photograph. They're pretty much mirrored on both sides of it. So this is a really good example of top to bottom and left to right. So think about this with symmetry and with symmetry you always want to have your main subject and focus right in the center of the frame so the viewer's eyes should be brought right through into the middle of the frame here is another example now this one here is a left to right example of symmetry we haven't got a top to bottom in this particular instance but symmetry is brilliant for doing architectural photography um, in particular because lots of buildings are made you know designed to be symmetrical so if you're into doing architecture and you want to capture a little bit of symmetry um you know it's a really really good thing to to try out and to play around with um so here we can see as i said we've got a simple left to right symmetry in this instance Moving on, one of the most popular compositional techniques is the use of leading lines. And as you can kind of guess, leading lines will lead us through the photograph. We pick a line and it brings us through the shot. Let's have a look at an example here. Very straightforward example. We can see very, very clearly we have this triangular shape, this bridge that is literally leading us through the shot. It uh, all converges in a point in the distance. So it brings our attention all the way across the bridge, all the way into the distance. Might be a little bit difficult to see it if you're watching on a phone, but there's an American flag all the way down there in the end. So good use of leading lines there. Here's another good example um, in London. Uh, as you can see, a lot more leading lines happening in this shot. So the photographer has got down quite low here to get this, to get the leading lines. We can see we've got the lines on the edge of the bridge here over on the left hand side. We've got the line of the curb. We've got those double yellow lines here as well. We've got that bicycle lane line and we've got the lines of the long exposure of the cars and the bus. So, you know, all of these kind of coming together to bring us right through into the middle of the photograph. It's a superb example. Now, one that you may have heard of a lot um, but wondered what it is, is the golden ratio. The golden ratio, which is one that um, is used a lot in art as well um, and has had made its way into photography. So the golden ratio is based on an idea that 
certain objects and um, certain things around us have a kind of a natural uh, balance to them. And this is based on a mathematical sequence of numbers known as the Fibonacci sequence where, where you're adding up numbers based on the previous number. So for example, you've got one and then one plus one equals two and then uh, two plus one equals three 3 plus 2 equals 5, 5 plus 3 equals 8, etc. It keeps going on in that way. And the idea is that it creates this perfect proportion, um, as you can see. So it's a Fibonacci spiral is also what it is known as as well. And this is a really good example of it here. As we can see, um, it's got quite a low horizon here, but it still works. It still looks like everything is placed uh, correctly within the photograph. Now, the Fibonacci uh, uh, spiral or the golden ratio, whatever you prefer to call it, it is a trickier one to master. But if you start with the rule of thirds, that's a good place to start because the reality is they're not too far away from each other. The uh, golden spiral or the Fibonacci sequence, whatever you want to call it, uh, just that that little bit trickier to get right. But again, look at this is a great example of it. So with those tips and guidelines in mind, uh, we can mix it all up by changing our point of view. And point of view is not the same as our angle of view that we saw with our lenses in the previous lesson. Point of view is simply the direction that we look in. So for example, as simply looking up is going to create a unique perspective for our photographs. It's great for shapes and leading lines. And think about doing it when you're in forests, like in the example here, or in cities as well, where the action is above us. There's plenty going on overhead at all times. Be sure to look up now and again and capture a shot. And wide shots work very well for this, like in this great example. Low angles are also good for portraits as well, um, like in this particular instance. You do need to be careful. It can be unflattering. So, um, you know, always be sure to take time to pose the person correctly as well. Um, but it does give a sense of strength and power. Like in this photograph, there is an, an authority to the image. So, and also think about using the environment to frame your subject for a stronger composition. Now, of course, Think about the angle of light as well. You don't want to try and have your, your subject facing directly into the light, but maybe have them facing away or side on. So always be considering your light as and the direction of where it's coming from as well. From above is also um, a great perspective. It's nice and relaxed. It gives a, a real sense of playfulness, the sense of ease and rest. But it's much more casual. It wouldn't be great for doing more kind of corporate or um, you know professional work where they're looking for something a little bit more sophisticated. But for friends and family, that it's a great angle to be photographing them from. When you're in concerts, when you're in anywhere with a crowd, crowds are difficult to photograph in any situation, even with um, you know the most sophisticated cameras. Um, just hold it up. Just gives a great sense of being in the action, uh, of being uh, right in there in the moment. The delay timer, as I've mentioned in our first lesson, is very very useful for this as well. But always be conscious of the people behind you as well. They don't want to be watching the concert through your phone. So, you know, if you are doing this and you're doing this type of photography, be respectful of everybody around you as well so that you don't annoy them. And perhaps one of the most important things that I can say when photographing children in particular is to get to their level, get down to their height. It's no good just to be photographing them up from above. It creates a sense of disconnection. As I mentioned previously as well, you should be making connections with the eyes where possible so getting to a child's level brings us into their world and makes a connection you just could get this type of photograph if you were kind of towering above them it would be a much more kind of uh, intimidating almost kind of photograph i suppose from a child's perspective and as i mentioned standing above creates a disconnection with the child with the viewer and even just getting back down to their level brings us back to our own childhood and reminds us when we were that small as well also, don't forget to do this for your pets as well. See the world through their eyes, getting low down with your cats, with your dogs, with your, your tortoises, with your goldfish, whatever it is you happen to have. And again, do, practice the same techniques here as well. See the world from their perspective. 
Now, so I just want to give a quick look at what's coming up in the next lesson. We're going to be having a look all about motion and depth. Good example here of it, the motion of the running water and the nice shallow depth of field there behind it. So we're going to have a look at how we can control those two things within our phones. This will also add to our compositional techniques as well because we can choose to add in motion and depth into any of the, one of the compositional techniques that we've had a look at. Our final topic, just a short little topic to round things off. Just want to briefly speak about cropping and aspect ratio. So first of all, cropping um, is basically when we crop in on a photograph, we, we take the shot and we decide to take out parts of the photograph retrospectively. And I just want to say it's okay to crop a photograph. There's this romantic idea that photographs need to try and get everything right in camera. This is a very restrictive way to work. It just simply doesn't work. It's very difficult to get, no matter how much we try, to get that one perfect shot. Um, I mean, we should always, I suppose, in a sense, strive for it, but it's absolutely fine to crop in afterwards. Um, sometimes you'll see something in a shot afterwards. You want to remove distractions or something like that. Cropping is just another tool, another skill that you can use and that you can rely on but you should still use cropping within the um, guidelines and the parameters that I've outlined in this lesson. Now just to give you an example of this perhaps one of the most famous photographs again in the 20th century uh, from a more artistic perspective is uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson um, very very famous photograph here and he was notorious for never wanting to crop his photographs he avoided it um, pretty much every single shot he he took he's like has to be all captured within one what he calls the the decisive moment however he photographed this one through a railing which you can see very very clearly here over on the left hand side of the right image okay you can see that he had to crop that out so uh, that obviously ruins the photograph it's a major distraction but by taking it out then we get this um really incredible photograph where we've got the jumping man and the, the ballerina there behind him kind of mimicking him what he's doing on the poster so it is absolutely fine to crop now just to speak about aspect ratio this simply refers to the shape of the photographs the width and the height the relationship between the width and the height of the shot lots of different aspect ratios here and um, aspect ratio is something that applies very much in cinema as well and it's just simply the shape of our photograph and we can use different aspect ratios to to give a different sense of uh, placement within the shot so starting off with a one-to-one -one ratio is simply a square square photograph a square format and if you remember back to the early days of instagram everything was in this ratio uh, quite frustrating um for for photographers at that time um in a way though um you know one to one ratio is actually what a lot of medium format cameras will shoot they'll do a perfect square like this but as you can see it's still following the rule of thirds we still have our guidelines here and um, you know kind of helping to balance the shot and it's great for portraits great for doing portraits but not limited to that at all you can use it for any purpose really then we have our four to three ratio um, this one is was a movie standard ratio actually for a very very long time and a, a TV standard ratio as well or old TV screens would have followed uh, a format very very similar to this it's also a photographic format as well um, this one is also I find to be very very nice for doing kind of portrait photography as well just to give a little bit of space around the subject too but again absolutely not limited to what you want to do with this format probably the one that we use most frequently most often nowadays is our three to two ratio this is essentially giving us the entire frame as you can see here um you know we we have all of the photograph here and you know if you're trying to just get uh, i suppose cover yourself with your photography you should just be photographing in three to two it should be your standard and it's always possible then to kind of crop into those other uh, aspect ratios afterwards if needs be it is nice to photograph in those aspect ratios though as well within your phone because uh, it'll help train your eyes it'll help to train them to see using those different ratios finally then we have our 16 to 9 ratio which is our widescreen format and this is great if you're after kind of a cinematic quality to your shots widescreen being the standard nowadays for cinema and indeed for television as well 
So if you're after that type of shot, that type of uh, perspective, uh, 16.9 is the way to go. And of course, certainly for your video as well, you should be considering photographing or videoing in 16 to 9. Now, so that is the end of our lesson. Coming up in lesson four, just have a quick look at it, we're going to be having a look at motion and depth, as I mentioned. We're going to have a look at how we can control motion to create blurry photographs, like in the center here, how we can track subjects to freeze them in motion, and how we can also obtain shallow depth of field using our phones as well. It's, it's a very important lesson because these are also parameters for controlling exposure too, so you really need to understand shutter speed and aperture to capture motion and depth please subscribe like and share